Hello, everyone. Both uh, TNARC in person, remote, and all the Jumpstart students, uh, hopefully trickling in in the next few minutes. Welcome also to all of our online guests today joining us remotely. I'm really excited uh, to introduce a fellow colleague of mine, Natalie Alima, today. And I'm briefly going to introduce Natalie. She's a researcher with a multidisciplinary approach to architecture that fuses biology and robotics and parametric design. She founded practice Biolab and is a 3D generative designer for Adidas. She has a passion for controlling, manipulating, and hacking into nature through intricate and complex geometries. Natalie recently completed an ANAT Synapse Residency at Sensi Lab with Professor John McCormack. And the project explores new processes that link digital design, robotic fabrication, and biological systems. Something new we haven't seen so far in this lecture series. Natalie completed her Master of Architecture at the Institute for Advanced Ar Architecture of Catalonia where she specialized in digital fabrication and the merging of organic materials. She recently also completed a PhD at RMIT in Australia, supervised by Roland Snooks and John McCormack. It is really exciting for us to have Natalie here today to see both, uh, see her speak about her professional work, her research and her academic research. And with that, I'm very happy to welcome Natalie to give us a lecture here today at UCLA AUD. Thanks, Julia, for the intro and thanks everyone for having me. I'll just grab some water before we get started. So thanks for having me here today. I'm here to present my research, which involves the relationship between computational design, uh, robotic fabrication, and biological materials. Um, but before I get into my research, I'll just give you a brief uh, background about my experience and expertise within the industry. So I trained as an architect in Australia, so hence the accent. Uh, much like you guys, I was studying how to create buildings and studying building facades. Um, and then for my master's, I went to Ike University in Barcelona. And here I really became passionate about robotic fabrication, 3D printing and parametric design. So I returned back to Australia to work for quite a well-renowned architecture firm called Ellenberg Fraser. Um, so on my first day, I hated it. Um, I was like, you know, where's the robotic fabrication? Where's the complex forms? You know, my first day I was designing a bathroom layout and I thought to myself, this cannot be architecture. So I decided to return back to academia to pursue my PhD. And I also taught at RMIT University in Australia. Um, and there I really got the opportunity to develop my passion for um, material science, robotic fabrication, uh, 3D printing and computational design. So, when completing my PhD, I got a job as a generative designer for Adidas here in LA, and I moved here about a year ago. Um, so today I'll be presenting my research and how I apply my PhD research to large corporations such as Adidas. So today I'll be presenting the fusion and relationship between computational design, living materials and robotic fabrication. And I'll be discussing how these three elements that are normally treated as individual fields can be merged together and almost have a direct dialogue with one another. So the first project I'll be presenting is called Bioscaffolds. Um, Bioscaffolds include the robotic infusion of liquefied mycelium. So for those who are unaware, mycelium is a fibrous root of a mushroom. Um, its chemical characteristics include its ability to act as a natural binder and uh, remove toxins from water. 
Um, there are actually a lot of Netflix documentaries about mycelium if you're interested in learning about that further. Um, so what we see here in this picture is the robot actually injecting the, my the mycelium in the liquefied culture of the syringe into the 3D print, that round thing that you see on the side. So as a designer, I'm very much interested in this multidisciplinary approach to architecture. And what that means is where I draw inspiration isn't just from design or architecture, but it's the external fields around me. So in my case, I'm very much interested in the scientific field. Um, and the reason I'm interested in the scientific and biomedical fields is because the biomedical field is really well renowned for using living materials, 3D printing and computational design. So there's really interesting technologies um, that are currently being developing, um, such as bioprinting, um, tissue engineering, and bioscaffolds. And what that basically means is they're free printing organs um, and putting them into the human body to replace um, broken hips or if we needed a, a heart valve or you know anything that's broken within our bodies. Um, so the bioscaffold is basically a three printed temporary framework um, seated with living cells and then implanted in the human body. So how that's applied to architecture. So I've been interested in this technology for a number of years and researching and thinking about, okay, how do we take this existing technology occurring within the scientific industry and, that, and then apply it to the architectural industry? Um, and, you know, within the scientific industry, everything's very micro. So how do we apply this micro technology to architectural macro um, architectural building skins. So what I became really interested in is this idea of biodegradability and biocompatibility and how do we apply that to architectural building facades. So similar to the uh, medical bioscaffolds, mycelium is able to biodegrade through a range of fibrous forms in order to seek nutritious substrates. So what you see here is a series of scientific experiments that I've conducted to test um, what materials the organism eats through or adapts through most or, or quicker at a more rapid pace. And through this research, I discovered that mycelium biodegrades through a range of wooden fibers at a particularly rapid pace uh, because it's interested in absorbing its nutrient substrates. So similar to when you walk in a forest, you'll often see mushrooms growing on rotten wood and logs. Um, that's mycelium being attracted to the fibrous properties within wood. So with this knowledge that exists in nature, I decided to convert this and think about, okay, how can we replicate nature through robotics? Um, so what you see here is an image of a 3D printed wooden scaffold. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Um, which replicates wood within nature. And what you see here is the mycelium, so the mushroom. And then whatever, what you see here in this image here is me injecting a liquefied culture of the mushroom into the wooden formwork. And then over time, the mycelium, which is the white substrate, grows across the wooden formwork over time and actually eats through the temporary scaf scaffolds. So this idea of how to orchestrate nature through form and materiality. So I'm someone who's also obsessed with robots. So everything I do in my experiments, I try to automate through robotic automation. So what I've done here is I've manually injected the mycelium initially, but what I've tried to do here is have the robot actually inject the living culture into the organism and almost replace the human and inject the um, organism accordingly to how the organism reacts. So for example, you can see here in these um, thumbnail images, if the organism was living or dying, the robot would react accordingly and inject additional mycelium culture. Um, this form here is a 3D printed wooden form um, that's completely biodegradable. So over the time, the mycelium, which is the white elements here, began to grow throughout the fabricated form. And this image is quite interesting over here because it really showcases that relationship between the artificial and the natural and the fabricated form versus biological growth. So as you can see here, the biological growth is actually growing throughout the digital fabricated antennas of the wooden scaffolds. So this idea of how to orchestrate biological growth through form and robotic intervention. 
And then over time, the mycelium actually began to fruit mushrooms, as you can see here in this image. So this is the image of the mycelium eating through the scaffolds. This was about after seven weeks of growth. And this image here is the final um, scaffold of the mycelium completely eating through the designate structure. And what's really interesting about this image here is this idea of hacking into natural growth and creating patterns of growth that you wouldn't ordinarily see in nature. So this idea of like human and biological growth working together to generate something new and innovative. So with these experiments, I decided to think what forms would actually encourage biological growth or hinder biological growth. So um, through rapid experimentation, I discovered that porous systems really encourage biological growth as the mycelium is able to pierce through internal walls at a really rapid pace. So here's this um, image of an empty scaffold. And here's an image of the mycelium growing through, through the scaffold and eventually biodegrading it, as you can see here in this image. Uh, similar to porous systems, uh, mycelium is really attracted to lattice systems as it provides additional nutrients for the organism to pierce through and eventually biodegrade. As you can see here, the white exterior exposes how healthy and flush the organism is. So with this idea of how to orchestrate biological growth through form, I designed a series of heterogeneous skins that, that range from smooth surfaces, as you can see here, that discourage biological growth, to quite porous lattice systems designed to encourage biological growth. So this idea of designing form with purpose and forms that encourage um, biological growth and have this almost like timeline of decay. And what's really interesting about these images is that this idea of designing an architecture, not just for humans, but also for nature. So what do natural systems want to see in form? How does mycelium want to live in a house, for example? How would you design a house for nature? Um, so this idea of not only having clients as humans, but having clients as non-human species as well. Um, so my design process is definitely the pursuit of non-indexicality. And what that really means is when you see a form, when, when you start um, getting into architecture, you'll see um, you'll have particular processes on how you create form, whether it be drawing or using a particular 3D program. Um, and when someone sees your form, they can automatically tell, okay, you use this computer program to generate that form or use that particular algorithm. So what I'm trying to do here is really generate forms that are hard to tell if they've been naturally grown or artificially made. So to create this sense of ambiguity of where the form is actually derived from. So my design process is definitely to amplify the alien, to create this kind of weird looking creatures that blur the boundaries between uh, the natural realm and um, the artificial. So these almost look like coral structures, but in a sense, not really. So it's hard, your eye can't really tell how the form is generated or if it's natural or artificial. So similar to how um, a plant, let's just say grows in nature, how the environment can actually manipulate plant growth through light or humidity, et cetera. Um, I'm really interested in how the environment can manipulate um, form, form, formal growth. So here I've designed a series of algorithms that affect the, the, the computational form. And here the form is morph morphing into a series of lattice systems across the edges. Um, here for these forms, scale plays an important factor as the forms bundle the base for stability and then branch off to wispy ends towards the ends. So it's an idea of creating heterogeneous skins. And what that basically means is creating skins that um, transition in scale, texture, porosity, um, similar to our human skin, how it transitions from hard areas to smooth areas, to, to hairy areas, to goosebump areas, to bring that ideology to computational form. Um, and here's just an image of the computational forms I showed previously 3D printed. Um, so this series is called the Bioscaffold series. Um, so it's a series of 3D printed forms about this big uh, presented together as a catalog. Um, here I just want to show, show some close-ups of these 
um, form. So here you can see the smooth surfaces transitioning into the lattice systems. And so that was the empty scaffolds. And here are the mycelium growing throughout the 3D printed geometry. So as you can see here the, in the before and after, so here's like an empty uh, scaffold. And here's the organism actually trying to fill in those areas. So it's a really interesting idea of how to orchestrate natural growth and create these kind of micro pathways for it to grow through. Um, again, here's the empty scaffolds. This is the three printed form. Um, and here's the, the mushrooms growing along the three printed scaffolds. And again, it's really interesting here how the natural and the artificial marry really well together. Um, so it's hard to tell, you know, where the natural growth begins and where the artificial scaffold ends. Um, so this next project that I'll present um, explores 3D printed biodegradable wall panel systems infused with mycelium insulation. So utilizing mycelium again. So if you think, if you look at a wall panel system within architectural buildings, they're actually often uh, filled with quite petrochemical material. So they often have foam insulation within them, which is could be quite toxic to our breathing and very difficult to biodegrade to the earth. So this research really explores how to create sustainable um, architectural wall panel systems using made with nature products. So what you see in this picture here is the mycelium, which is the white, um, so that's that mushroom substrate. Um, and what's that basically used for is to provide the wall panel system with stability and acoustic properties. And what you see here in the blue is the 3D printed um, biodegradable skins. So here's just an initial prototype of the mycelium wall panel systems. Um, what you see here is recycled plastic used to 3D print this wall panel system. And the mycelium used to provide the skins with structural stability. And what that basically means is that you can use more um, made with nature products and less uh, petrochemical materials. So what you see here is a really thin fabricated form and the mycelium taking a um, majority of the weight of the fabricated form. And, and then the mushroom sprouting towards the ends. So computationally, these um, wall panel systems were designed to mimic um, reptile skins. Um, so using multi-agent algorithms, which is basically um, how it basically worked is if you see these three components in the white, these three components were utilized to array across the surface, generating that rippled skin. And the purpose for creating that rippled skin is um, having texture for the mycelium to grip onto and latch onto. Um, so this is just an image of the robot 3D printing that wall panel system, which was about two meters high. Um, and what's really interesting about this robot is this is the Kuka robot, and this robot is actually commonly utilized to, it's a six um, axis arm robot, and it's commonly utilized to, um, for car assembly. Um, but what's really interesting about this case is we used it to 3D print quite large scale structures. So you can see the extruder mounted on the, the robot over here. So advancing this research further, so this was originally 3D printed with plastic, as you can see here. So we began to think, okay, how can we make this uh, prototype more sustainable? How can it return back to the earth at a more quickly and rapidly pace? So similar to the previous research that was 3D printed out of wood, um, we began to think, how can we make these structures out of wooden filament? Um, so here's just the initial prototype of the mycelium growing inside the wooden panel system. And then began to, we began to experiment what's the relationship between the fabricated skin on the outside and the mycelium growing internally. Um, so here's just images of the mycelium blooming mushrooms. Um, and as you can see here in this second prototype, the skins are getting more delicate and more delicate and thinner. And what that basically means is we can use less materials and rely on nature more to provide architectural structures. And again, um, referring to the previous research of how to um, orchestrate biological growth. So here you can see the mycelium um, really um, showcasing its white whispery texture in comparison to this like cumbersome foam-like texture. So you can really orchestrate different growth patterns depending on which forms you choose to utilize and what materials. 
Um, and here's just an, another image of the mycelium growing vertically across the structures. Um, and in this case, the form encouraging um, mushrooms to grow throughout the structure. And here's just an image of the robot 3D printing that wooden prototype. Um, so this next project that I'll showcase explores um, 3D printing the organism directly and completely eliminating the need for a structural host system. So what you see here in this image here is um, mycelium mixed with clay and, and 3D printed. And why we chose to utilize clay is it acts as a natural binder for the mycelium to adhere to once uh, 3D printed. And this um, relates to a broader idea of generating uh, bi biodegradable architecture. So how can we utilize um, the natural resources that we have on land to build architectural uh, facades? And also thinking about the timeline of buildings. So how can you create temporary structures and design when they um, biodegrade back to the earth? So uh, to test this uh, initial idea, we began 3D printing the material on a UR10 robot. So here's the robot 3D printing the clay and the mycelium together. And here you can see the mycelium growing from the 3D printed extrusions. And what's really interesting about this process is, you know, normally when you 3D, 3D print an object, you have the final object and that's it, you're done. What's really interesting about 3D printed with nature is nature will continuously grow once you've 3D printed the object and almost take a life of its own. So here we're just testing different geometries and different um, draft angles with the material. Just some more images of that. Um, so now I'll just quickly touch on, so those are projects I developed through my PhD and now I'll quickly touch on how I'm actually applying these ideas to the commercial industry. So as mentioned before, I'm quite interested in this idea of biofabrication. So this idea of how to bring um, biology and robotics into the commercial industry to create more sustainable materials. So here we're currently developing um, kombucha leathers to replace leathers within shoes. And here I'm currently, currently developing something, um, utilizing that mycelium technology, but how to bring it to footwear. Um, so here you can see like a mycelium, a shoe made out of mushrooms that I'm currently developing. Um, so this idea of how to bring made with nature products to the commercial industry. And obviously the mushrooms um, blew me from there. So it has actually been scientifically proven that when the human is close to nature, so when we can actually put our bare feet into nature, whether it be through soil or the beach or wherever nature is, it actually is very good for our mental health and calmness for our body. So how do, so I began thinking, okay, how do we bring made with nature back to the footwear industry? So how do, how do we create a shoe that makes you feel like you're walking on the forest grounds or you're working on the beach? Um, so here's just some initial images of that my slim firm that I'm currently developing. Um, so aside from material creator, I'm also a generative designer for Adidas. Um, I'll, here I'll just show you some initial um, products I'm working on. I obviously can't show anything unreleased, but here's just initial um, designs that I'm currently working on. And what's really interesting about this shoe is that I'm quite interested in this idea of redefining fashion. So how do we step away from what a shoe ordinarily looks like and create something new and innovative? And again, bring this idea of, is it artificially made? Is it naturally grown? Or what will shoes look like in the future as well? So for this concept, it was this idea of like a sock turning into a shoe um, that almost looks like it's been biologically made. Um, and here's just some more images of that. So these are computational images and here's just an initial prototype of that form 3 printed. Um, here's just a form testing like the, how the colors merge together as well. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, it's really um, the way design is to think about how form and function work together. So here you can see the, the shoe having this micro texture. So think about when we have shoes, you obviously have a grip to your shoe so you don't slip on slippery surfaces. So how can your this porous te texture almost act like um, grip for your shoe? And then again, testing various um, skin patterns as well. Um, and here's just the last slide before I conclude the presentation. Um, 
And again, I just want to showcase this ideology of how do you think of the future of shoes? So how can you combine um, hard, hard textures and soft textures to create one unified geometry um, so you can eliminate the use of like a sock, for example. Um, before I finish, I'll just quickly show a video, which is like a time lapse of like the robot, so you can see how it all goes together. Um, before I show that, if you want to see any more of my work, you can just follow me on Biolab Studio on Instagram. So I'll just jump into that video. So here's just a time-lapse image of the mycelium growing through the three printed scaffolds that I was designing, uh, discussing before. And this was over a seven day period. And here is an image of that robotic tool that I was discussing. So that idea of the robot intervening with biological growth. So here on this side, you can see the robotic syringe and on the other side, you have a Arduino moisture sensor. And that's injecting the mycelium liquefied culture. And here's just an image of the robot intervening with biological growth and injecting the um, biological culture. And what's, what's really interesting about this research actually is when people think about robots, we think about speed and efficiency. But what's actually happening here is it's very slow and very delicate. You know, it has to be able to completely knock the scaffolds off. So this idea of slow robotics that I'm exploring, um, so it's really delicate way to work with micro materials rather than, you know, these large industrial robots. And just a close up of the robot injecting the, li the, li the liquefied culture. And this form here is the three printed scaffold out of the wood. Um, and here is an image, you know, um, after a, about a seven to 14 day period of the mushroom growing from that initial insertion of the robot. Um, and here's just an image of how I um, grow the computational forms, which I discussed before about having the environment manipulate um, computational form. And here is an image of just the UI10 robot extruding that mycelium and clay um, mixture. And that is all. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to switch over to questions. So if you want to stay up here on the podium and then we're going to do questions. So oh. uh, maybe I'll start with one. Can I please ask you to all be silent so we can hear the questions and answers? Thank you. So one question I had was actually, it's two questions. One, when you super inspirational. Um, research what you're doing and uh, really really nice to see the evolution also how you kind of apply it to the to the product design and more uh, commercial side and I, I love the sentence when you said like how would it be like to walk on the forest floor again but actually wearing shoes I think that's a really cool statement to make and a, a really cool goal um, 
I wonder in your research, when you did your PhD and uh, especially the last video you showed, did you work with scientists together or other biologists who advised you on what that kind of solution should be, which you're applying onto the 3D print? Um, and then I will ask the, the question, the second one afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Julia. That's a really great question. Um, you know, it's really difficult as architects to branch into different disciplines. You know, if you call a scientist up and say, oh, can you help me grow a mushroom shoe? They'll probably like hang up the phone. Um, so the great thing about, you know, living in today's society is you can research anything really. So you can go on like YouTube, read books. So the way I kind of started with my slime is I, did a lot of research myself and a lot of experiments myself at home. So what's really interesting about my research is kind of this like DIY experimentation at home, especially during COVID, um, you know, what else to do at home but grow mushrooms. So that's where it really all started. I got really hands-on and I really learned most of my stuff from doing it myself. Um, towards the end, I consulted a few scientists just to ask, you know, what additive materials can I use? Um, um, what else did I ask? Oh, where, you know, where to source certain ingredients, but the bulk of the experimentation was really done by myself. Yeah. And then uh, the second question I had was, when we think of that in an environment of architecture, how could this be applied on a larger scale? The mushrooms, when I my own mushrooms, I realized that they need a dark environment, mm -hmm. they need a lot of humidity, and they need uh, water every day. A bit, a bit of sprinkle. Yeah. And so if you think of a hot climate like Los Angeles, I, I think we would be very unsuccessful having wooden structures and then having mushrooms grow over them. Mm -hmm. Unless we kind of think of it, let's say, a temporarily tent, which would cover it, and we create a humidity what the mushrooms would need but then once you would remove the tent the mushrooms likely would die mm -hmm. so i think that i'm also curious like in regards to your colleague who designed this um tower at ps1 um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know with the mushroom brick mm -hmm. like what's the lasting life of it after it doesn't have the environment for growth anymore yeah so basically um, how my ceiling works is um, it really activates its structural properties once it's died, once it's dead. Um, so what people in, in the case of the tower, they grew the mycelium bricks um, offsite and then brought the mycelium bricks already when they were dried. Yeah. And then they assembled it like that. Um, so once it's dried, it doesn't require any, you know, growth properties such as humidity or anything like that because it's already a inert material. Um, and then mycelium, the mycelium structures like that last around 20 years before they begin to biodegrade, um, which in my opinion is enough for a stru architectural structure. I think, you know, our products and buildings should be biodegraded back to the earth and not outlive us all. Um, yeah, so that's basically, yeah. <laughs> Are there any further questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. The staffer would like to ask what are the grand challenges in your area of research between robotics, computational biomaterial, and design? What's the question? What are the challenges? Uh, yeah, what are the challenges in your research, in your area of research between robotics, computational biomaterial, and design? Um, I think one of the main challenges is. Um, that I'm having right now within the commercial industry is scale and cost. Um, so th this really works great if you're producing one mycelium shoe for an exhibition or an art piece, but it's quite different when you need to make 6 million in a month. Um, you know, it really takes a long time to grow. Um, we're still testing durability um, of the organism. So, you know, like, uh, tension and compression and can it can a mycelium shoe survive in the rain can a mycelium shoe uh, survive in really harsh uh, conditions so currently I think that's the challenge of how to create products that compare to our existing um, shoe materials such as foam and um, plastics um, so I would say that's currently the issue but we're trying to develop 
so we can bring it to the masses. Thank you. The robotic part uh, that injects the mycelium uh, is are the points, are the injection points pre programmed in, or is there an algorithm that automatically uh, determines where, uh, where to inject the mycelium? Yeah, that's a really great question. So initially, it was pre programmed in um, to inject in certain. I was going to show you a slide, but don't worry. Um, to inject in certain points. Um, but then if you saw in the video how it had that Arduino moisture sensor. So what that basically did is um, it monitored the growth of the organism in real time and then injected additional mycelium culture where it needed additional whoops, uh, growth. Um, so initially it was pre-programmed and then um, I transferred the research so it had this real-time feedback between the robot and the organism. So is your mind paying? I couldn't hear it properly. Okay, the uh, first one, uh, the artificial organs are the real organs. How are they close to each other? And the second one. Okay, so the artificial organs and the real organs. How close they are to each other. Um, do you mean like the um, 3D printed scaffolds and the mycelium? Yeah. Um, so basically, it grows right on top of it. So they almost fuse together, similar to like a glue. Um, so they grow quite closely to one another. So it sits quite closely, sorry. And the second book, how can the artificial organs grow? Um, so what, once it's 3D printed, how does it change? Is that the question? Oh, so you're talking about the initial um, three printed scaffolds and organs. Um, so basically, um, that research I utilize more as inspiration. It wasn't really part of the whole um, body of work. But basically, from my understanding, how bioscaffolds work is you, um, they're intended to biodegrade within your body. So they, so they take your cells, um, they inject it into the sacrificial formwork and then place in the body. Um, and then what the intention is, is that your organs will almost accept the, the new um, foreign element and then the scaffold will biodegrade within, the, within your human body. Yeah, thank you. I have a question in this space. So I was wondering maybe the organisms that could get sick, for example, and like spread and be like a structure or something. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so similar to you know other living or um, things that we have in nature, such as plants that dry out if they don't get enough sun or water, my slim can also get really infected and dry out. Um, so I definitely have plenty of experience. Plenty of failed experiments when the mycelium um, received bacteria and stopped growing and turned green. Um, so definitely a lot of elements if you don't um, water it properly, provide it with this um, it, optimal temperatures or prevent bacteria growth, it can die off quite quickly. Um, so yes, that does happen. Uh, so you're talking about how like the injection of the mycelium cultures is like really precise and specific, but you need it to be a lot like more on a grand scale if you want to like, design a building with that. How could that translate from like a really precise, like tiny, like I think you call it microbiotic to a more of like a grand scale for architecture? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So I think there's a few things you can do. Um, one of the things you can always create like micro bots. So having these like micro robots crawl over the building facade, and inject the organism at, at different points. Um, or similar to the bricks that they've done it um, for Hi-Fi Tower, you can create the things offsite and then bring them to construct the building facade like a modular system. Um, we have more questions from the Thank you.
So basically how it works is um, with 3D printing, you can 3D print with a range of plastics. So if you, for, you have a series of plastics such as ABS, so what um, like Lego blocks are made out of, they also have this filament called PLA, which is based on cornstarch. Um, and then how it works with the wooden one is there's this customized filament called, um, so it's wood mixed with PLA, mixed with cornstarch. And it basically has like a filament roll and they feed that filament into this um, extruder and the extruder melts the plastic and then prints it layer by layer. Yeah, so basically with the what's great about that filament is the plastic is based on cornstarch um, mixed with wood, so that's completely biodegradable. Um, but then what I was also exploring with my research is how to completely eliminate the need for a scaffold and 3D print the organism directly, and that was done with the clay. Um, so thinking about ways to completely eliminate the plastic as well. How do you find all the materials for the robot and actually assemble all of them? Because you said that you did all of this at home. So I had to have a kind of tricky to get all of the logistics put back together. Um, so the robot part I did um, at university. So I utilized their robot and then constructed the tool to put on the robot. But the 3D prints were actually done on a desktop 3D printer, which I had at home. So I could do that um, quite easily. Um, and in terms of the mycelium, I um, grew, grew that at home as well. Um, what else do I have? And the computational stuff I did at home. Um, but yeah, it, uh, with the robots, the large scale robots that was done at the university facility. Yeah. I'm a student. I have a question about like how accessible do you see um, the research becoming any kind of mess with um, your want to produce for like helping something like put that into like mass action? And how do you see um, this kind of like concept of physical growing and biodegradable, et cetera, um, inserting itself into like an industry that is going like the opposite direction? Um, do you see like the your initial concept kind of like getting So I, I really think that the industry is turning away from fast fashion. I think people are realizing how harmful companies such as H&M and Zara actually are to the planet. And like, if you look at all the landfill that's been generated from this fast fashion, it's really exactly, yeah. Um, you know, and these clothes aren't biodegradable. They basically will outlive us all. So I think, you know, the, the industry is really turning towards more sustainable materials and products that won't outlive us. You know, I think most of us will wear a pair of shoes, maybe five, maybe six years, and then we'll get over it, throw it out. Um, but that product will still be around till, till after you die. So how do we have products that maybe live around five years and then biodegrade before we purchase a new one? So I think the industry is really going to this idea of buying less, having products that biodegrade quicker and having a shorter lifespan as well. Are they anti-cancer? Um, no, so they're mostly designed to fix um, the, the, the scaffold work that you're referring to. Uh, they're mostly designed to fix like um, broken bones or valves within our body and not really to do with any um, internal diseases or sicknesses. Um, super interesting part. Love it. I have a question kind of related to Leo's question earlier around so if you're prefabricating panels with mycelium and then you, you burn them out essentially so that they can last for 20 years. In most of your work, it seems like you let the 
um, organism have its own control and its own agency over the work. I'm curious to know is if there's a specific moment at which you, as a designer, retake that agency and decide perhaps to um, either stop the growth so that it stays in specific. Because I was wondering with the work in the uh, specifically the insulation work. Mm -hmm. So, is there a moment at which you retake control, decide that okay, it's enough insulation, it's enough space to insulate the before it actually takes over the whole um, the wall system? And then, I'm wondering where do you make that distinction? When do you make that decision? Yeah, that's a really great question. In the initial research, I was really interested in allowing the organism to flourish and take over the entire um, scaffold. And that was more this idea of nature and the architect working together and relinquishing design agency with each other. Um, in the final project, the wall power system, which is more architectural, um, the mycelium was grown through the structure and then eventually made inert. And then once it's made inert, it no longer grows. And that's when you say, okay, I, it's like fulfilled its purpose of growing into the mold and now it's being utilized for structural purposes. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie, for your time and for uh, spending this lunch time with us here in UCLA. And uh, I hope that uh, um, it was very inspiring for all the students and thank you for all your questions and engagement. Thanks a lot, guys.